Good morning and welcome to worship. Let us worship God. Let us sing to his praise and glory in him 132. Him 132, immortal, invisible, God only wants. Forgive our disloyalty, forgive our 
distraction. Transform the feebleness of our will and the poverty of our effort and send us out in this new week ahead to preach your word in all we say and in all we do through Jesus Christ our Lord who has taught us to pray together as his believing family and to say our Father which art in heaven hallowed be thy name thy kingdom come thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors and lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil for mine is the kingdom power of the glory forever. Amen. Our first scripture reading this morning is from 2 Samuel, 2 Samuel chapter 12 at verse 1. And it's going to be read for us now by Elizabeth. Hear the word of God. Nathan rebukes David. The Lord sent Nathan to David. When he came to him, he said, There were two men in a certain town, one rich and the other poor. The rich man had a very large number of sheep and cattle, but the poor man had nothing except one little new lamb that he had bought. He raised it, and it grew up with him and his children. It shared his food, drank from his cup, and even slept in his arms. It was like a daughter to him. Now a traveller came to the rich man, but the rich man refrained from taking one of his own sheep or cattle to prepare a meal for the traveller who had come to him. Instead, he took the ewe lamb that belonged to the poor man and prepared it for the one who had come to him. David burned with anger against the man and said to Nathan, As surely as the Lord lives, the man who did this deserves to die. He must pay for that lamb four times over because he did such a thing and had no pity. Then Nathan said to David, You are the man. This is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says. I anointed you king over Israel, and I delivered you from the hand of Saul. I gave your master's house to you, and your master's wives into your arms. I gave you the house of Israel and Judah. And if all this had been too little, I would have given you even more. Why did you despise the word of the Lord by doing what is evil in his eyes? You struck down Uriah the Hittite with the sword and took his wife to be your own. You killed him with the sword of the Ammonites. Now, therefore, the sword, the sword shall never depart from your house, because you despised me and took the wife of Uriah the Hittite to be your own. This is what the Lord says, Out of your own household I am going to bring calamity upon you. Before your very eyes I will take your wives and give them to one who is close to you, and he will lie with your wives in broad daylight. You did it in secret, but I will do this thing in broad daylight before all Israel. Then David said to Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. Nathan replied, The Lord has taken away your sin. You are not going to die. But because by doing this you have made the enemies of the Lord show utter contempt, the son born to you will die. Amen. Thank you, Elizabeth. We continue in our worship by singing hymn 112, God who is Almighty World.
reading from the New Testament, and firstly, some verses from the letter of James. James chapter 1 at verse 22. James 1 and 22. Only be sure that you act on the message and do not merely listen. For that would be to mislead yourselves. A man who listens to the message but never acts upon it is like one who looks in a mirror at the face nature gave him. He glances at himself and goes away, and at once forgets what he looked like. But the man who looks closely into the perfect law, the law that makes us free, and who lives in its company, does not forget what he hears, but acts upon it. That is the man who, by acting, will find happiness. And then from the Holy Gospel, according to Luke chapter 18, at verse 18. Luke 18 and 18. A man of the ruling class put this question to Jesus. Good master, what must I do to win eternal life? Jesus said to him, Why do you call me good? No one's good except God alone. You know the commandments. Do not commit adultery, do not murder, do not steal, do not give false evidence, honour your father and mother. The man answered, I've kept all these since I was a boy. On hearing this, Jesus said, There is still one thing lacking. Sell everything you have and distribute to the poor and you will have riches in heaven, and come and follow me. At these words, his heart sank, for he was a very rich man. Amen, and may God bless to us these readings from his word. And to his name be the glory and the praise. Now our prayers of intercession and thanksgiving, let us pray. Almighty God, Father of all mercies, we, your unworthy servants, give you most humble and most hearty thanks for all your goodness and all your loving kindness to us and to all men and women. We thank you for life and all its blessings, blessings that come to us new every morning, for the heat and warmth of the sun, for the good and fruitful earth, for the changing seasons that come and go unfailingly, for the labour of people in field and factory, for the service of those in this and in other lands by whose work we are fed and clothed and housed. But above all, we thank you for he who came, the babe of Bethlehem, the boy at Nazareth, to share our human lot, to live and to labour among men and women, and to pour out his life for the redemption of mankind, and to deliver us from sin and death, Jesus Christ our Lord. Blessing and honour and glory and praise, this is the theme of the hymn that we raise. Loving Saviour, who came to serve and to suffer for mankind, as we come before you, we pray for all those who stand in need this day, all those throughout the world who are experiencing suffering themselves. Those who are cast down, those who are fearful of heart amid the sorrow of this world, for all in need, we offer our prayers for the sick of mind or body, the widowed, the orphan, the poor, the hungry, the sorrowing, the anxious and the perplexed. Give them by your grace and in your mercy courage and patience and perseverance and peace of heart. For your name's sake. Grant them faith to look beyond their troubles to you, their Heavenly Father and their unchanging friend. 
Loving Father, we pray for ourselves. Make us increasingly instruments of your help to those in need. Strengthen our faith. When we stumble, hold us. When we fall, lift us up. When we are hard pressed by evil, deliver us. And when we turn from what is good, turn us back and bring us and all people at the last to your eternal kingdom, where once again we may be reunited with those whom we have loved and lost, those who have fought the good fight of faith and have emerged triumphant. Almighty Father, hear these our prayers, which we offer in the name and for the sake of your Son, our Saviour Jesus Christ, to whom together with you, the Father and the Holy Spirit, one God, the honour, glory, dominion and praise, world without end. Amen. Then we're going to sing him 534. Before we sing it, I want you to look at a couple of the verses that will appear on the screen. I want to say a word about verse 2 and verse 3. And verse 2 is there for you on the screen. In these two verses, clearly there are an analogies being made. In verse 2, my heart is weak and poor until it master find. It has no spring of action sure. It varies with the wind. The analogy in this verse is to a pocket watch, not the wind. It's wind. Proof of the pudding until it master find and like to. Master is spelled a small m, not a capital M, relating to the master spring of the watch. Varies with the wind. And then uh, it, it goes on, it cannot drive the it, 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 Thank you, Dr. Subrave, yes. Uh, it has no spring of action to move. It cannot freely move to although it has a rot, it's chained to the chain again of the watch. That's just a word about the second verse, so that we sing and pronounce the words correctly. And the third verse uh, is an analogy to, uh, clearly an analogy to a steam engine. My power is faint and low, till I have learned to serve. It wants the needed fire to blow. It wants the breeze to know. Cannot drive the world until itself be driven. Its flag can only be unfurled. And now shall we have clearly an analogy to a steam engine. These comments are just for your interest. You may already know all of that, but you didn't. Now you know. So let's sing the hymn. Hymn number 534, Make Me a Captive Law.
God the Son and God the Holy Spirit. Amen. In that letter of James, part of which I read to you, we're given a vivid picture, a parable of a looking glass, a mirror. And the point in the parable is that in spite of the looking glass, some people really just don't know what they look like. A man looks into the glass, the writer says, and he sees his face. And then he goes off and forgets. Doesn't really learn to see himself as he is. And if this is true in the natural world, it's true also, of course, in the spiritual world. There are two. We need a looking glass, a mirror, that will help us to see ourselves as we are. But of course it's difficult to, for us to look carefully at ourselves and see our own faults and blemishes that we might overcome them and go on to better things. It's far easier to shut our eyes and forget. But, says the writer of this letter, those who do look and learn from looking are truly the blessed people. First of all, then, where do we find this looking glass, this moral and spiritual mirror that we obviously need? To some extent, we can find it in books. In many novels, especially those that have within them an element of social satire, many writers, many novelists hold up a mirror to society and to our human nature in which the sins of the generation are reflected. These are not always pleasant reading, but they might be salutary reading showing us our own sins, our own failures, our own shortcomings. But to a greater extent by far, the Bible can hold up a mirror to our consciences. And this is clearly illustrated there in the story that Elizabeth read to us, the story of David and Nathan the prophet. David had been guilty of a terrible sin of cruel, mean, dastardly behaviour. He had had Uriah, remember, struck down in battle by positioning him right in the front line in order that he might take Uriah's wife, that's Sheba, to be his own wife. Albeit, he already had many wives and concubines too. And the further tragedy in the story was that David, because this had all been done by himself, he failed to see it. He failed to see it in all its wickedness. He was blind with self-esteem. He needed a mirror to be held up before him. And the prophet Nathan duly supplied one. One in the form of a story, and a classic it was, the story about two men, one of whom was rich, with large flocks and herds, and the other poor, who had nothing of his own except one little ewe lamb. A visitor came to the rich man's house, but too mean to take something from his own last herd, to serve up to his guest, the rich man took the poor man's lamb and served up that. David, when he heard this story, was incensed. The man who did that deserves to die. You are the man, says the prophet. It was like holding a mirror up in front of him. David cried out in disgust at the features of the man he 
you saw it in the mirror, Nathan told him, it's yourself you're looking at. The Bible ought to be that kind of mirror to us. And especially perhaps the Gospels. When we read there of how the different kinds of people reacted to Jesus, the Pharisees and the priests and the scribes, the common people and even Jesus' own disciples, of how their sins of pride and envy and jealousy and cowardice and pettiness sent Jesus to the cross. We shouldn't complacently pass judgment on these people. Rather, we should be subject to judgment ourselves. Because their sins are our sins. Their faults are ours. And we ought to see these clearly reflected in the looking glass of the Word of God. But even though we find our looking glass, even though we hold it up in front of our face, how difficult it is nonetheless to learn the lesson it clearly teaches. As the writer of the letter of James puts it, how prone we are to look and then to look away and forget and go on without repentance no better than before, he writes. How easy it is to read the Bible in that blind kind of way, to apply its judgments to other people, not to ourselves. We read in the Gospels, for example, of Jesus' denunciation of the Pharisees for religious hypocrisy and self-righteousness, and we complacently say amen to that. But we don't feel convicted of any of these qualities ourselves. And the very fact that we don't shows that we are self-righteous at times. We read the story as we did of that rich young man who just couldn't bring himself to make an act of renunciation in order to follow Jesus. And we say that he made the great refusal. But we don't dare ask ourselves whether we would have done the, what Jesus suggested, what Jesus asked him to do. And probably our lives indicate that we wouldn't. We read of Peter denying his master. We call that moral cowardice. We simply fail to notice that day in the earth we are behaving in a similar kind of way and displaying the same kind of cowardice in terms of our Christian witness in and to the contemporary world and to those around us. And even when we do apply these ancient lessons to contemporary life, we tend to apply them to other people, never to ourselves. This, alas, is one of the great spiritual dangers in, in an age of crises. We may be sure that God has indeed much to say to us through the dreadful and dastardly events of this age, the things that are happening in the world right now. And our reading and understanding of the Bible ought to help us to humbly hear it and penitently to accept God's judgment. But we let God judge only our enemies, never ourselves. Have we no share in these evils that we have seen and have rightly condemned in our enemies? Haven't we wandered off at perilous tangents? Haven't we run after strange gods? And isn't it a dangerous thing to say? that in the crises of these times, God has been judging our enemies and not us. How prone we are to look into the mirror in a blind self-righteous kind of way. Perhaps it's a longer, sharper, more focused look we need to take to see ourselves as we see others and as others see us. Perhaps the lesson we need desperately to learn is to be penitent and to take God's judgment home to ourselves. And finally, 
to those who do look into the looking glass and learn the looking glass of Scripture, there's a promise. The man who looks closely into the perfect law, which sets people free, who keeps on paying attention to it, and who doesn't simply listen and then forget it, but puts it into practice, that person will be blessed by God in whatever he does, as the good news Bible puts it. Those who look and learn from looking will find blessing. The writer of James speaks of looking into the perfect law of liberty, the law which sets people free. And here he's referring to the Christian gospel, which is quite different to the old Jewish law. Make me a captive law, and then I shall be free. The captive, captivating gospel has a liberating effect. Because it leads beyond judgment to mercy, to repentance, to forgiveness. It leads to a release from the past and to a new beginning. Looking into the looking glass of the gospel, we are pointed far beyond mere mortality to the liberating message of the mercy of God. It's vitally important to realise that the Christian way of life is not simply to see ourselves as we are, not even to see our faults and failings and concentrate on overcoming them, to cultivate our characters and to save our souls. The Christian way is even more than that. The Christian way is to look beyond our own sins to the goodness and grace and mercy and love of God in Jesus Christ. His gospel is a looking glass which reflects truly and sharply not only our own miserable selves but also the glory and the love of God. We've got to look longer. We've got to look deep. And if we continue to look into that looking glass, into that mirror, the mirror of the gospel, not only do we experience freedom in our lives, but we experience blessing and happiness as we live them out. Blessed assurance, glory divine. Those who look and learn
Let us pray. Take our gifts, O loving Jesus, use them in some lovely way for the happiness and comfort of the whole wide world this day. Amen. Blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. Him 5, 6, 1. Be with you this day and remain with you evermore.